So when I got here, it's been six years ago, when I got here, there was this office suite. And one of the things that I had inherited as the, really the only staff person is I inherited tons of keys. I don't know why, but seriously, containers of keys. They were in every desk for some reason. And so there were literally a pile of keys, these, this massive hundreds of keys that I inherited, and I had no idea what they did. They, they weren't labeled, they, 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 just, they were just keys, and so I'd, I'd put them on my desk, and I'd struggle because I'd have this new staff person coming in, and I'd like them to have keys to the building, but I don't want to give them the pile. That would be mean, right? And so what do I do? How do I find a set of keys for this person that will actually work and be a good steward and all of that? And so I found myself just standing in front of doors with piles of keys, have you ever been there? Have you ever seen a keychain like this? Have you ever had one of those? And somebody says, you receive one from a friend. They say, oh, it's just the brass key. It'll work. And you, you look at it. It's like, they're all brass, dude. And he says, oh, it's this one, right? And he'll approximate. And you go to the door, and you're just systematically trying one key after another. And you kind of get excited when one actually fits. You ever been there? One actually fits. It slides in. You're like, yes, this could be it. And you go to turn it, and it doesn't work. Ah, and so you, you put that one down, you go to the next, and it's just key after key after key. And it's absolutely frustrating. That's why we invented the master key. That some people call it still the skeleton key. It, it's the key that it doesn't matter what door you go to in the building, this key opens that lock. So it takes a keychain like this with well, I don't know how many keys are on there, but it takes them and it brings it down to a manageable three or four keys instead of hundreds of keys. That's what we finally did with the building, and it's great now. My keychain is very small. God realizes there's a problem in the same regard spiritually for us. We have the same kind of problem. He's given us a set of keys, but we have 613 of them. That's what he gave us, 613 keys for opening the doors of life. And when we're faced with a situation, we got to find the right key and say, oh, this is the key for this door, for this situation, and it can be really frustrating. In fact, I'm going to test how frustrating and how, how impossible this is. He gave us 613 of these, there's 613 rules, laws in the Bible, in the Old Testament. And they're the keys for life, right? They're, this is what I do in this situation. This is what I do. And just to show that's not manageable in the least, go home with a pen and paper and write out all 613 laws. Yeah, I hear the groans. None of us could do it, right? Not a single one of us could possibly manage those 613 rules, but that's what we got. It's like this keychain all over again. And how do you live life? How do you keep that many rules kind of in your mind and juggle them and do life the way? How do you even possibly keep track of them? You can't. So God helped us out a little. He says, well, I'll break it down and I'll distill it down to 10. And I'll give you 10 rules, the 10 commandments. And that will help you. And if you keep these 10, you'll be doing pretty good. Now, it still doesn't cover them all, but it's still 10 is way more manageable number of keys than 613. Well, then Jesus comes along, and he's the Savior in so many ways. He comes along, and he decodes it all for us and says, hey, really, there's a master key. There's one key that opens all doors. So he was put on the spot one day, and he was asked, what is the most important commandment? What, what, is, what is the greatest commandment? And he said, the first one, the most important commandment is love God. Love God with all that you are. Love him with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your mind, all your strength. And he said, this is the first and greatest commandment. This is the most important one. But then he gave us number two. And he says, the second is like it. Love your neighbor as yourself. Love your neighbor as yourself. And believe it or not, that second rule is the master key. It, it doesn't matter what situation you face, 
This is the key for that door. It doesn't matter where you are, wherever you're out in culture, it could be a political discussion, it could be dealing with the cashier at Walmart, it could be back at home with your family, it could be, hey, class life, now that school started. If you're in a situation, this is the rule, right? That's what the Bible tells us. This is the rule for that situation. So just to prove the point, Galatians 5, 14, notice what it says, for the entire law, That means all 613 rules, all 613 keys. For the entire law is fulfilled in keeping one command. Love your neighbor as yourself. So the first one was love God with all that you are. But the second one, which is the master key. So you have two keys on your key ring. The first one is love God. But the second one is love others as yourself. That's the master key. That's the skeleton key. That's the key that decodes every situation in life. The problem with that is what does that look like? What does it look to love your neighbor as yourself? So Jesus in the Sermon on the Mount takes it a step further and puts it in different terms for us. And that's where we are today. We're with the royal law. The royal law. It's what James calls. If you go to the book of James, he calls what we're going to talk about today. You probably heard it called the golden rule. But this is another way of picturing what love looks like. If you're really going to love somebody like you love yourself, what does it look like? And so we're going to go to that passage today, which is a challenging passage, because if you start all the way from chapter 7, verse 7, and go down to verse 12, it seems like this disjointed thing that's not connected. Well, they are. Everything fits, but we have to make it fit in the context that Jesus gave us. So let's jump down to verse 12, and let's start with the golden rule and try to figure out what Jesus is telling us here as we finish the Sermon on the Mount. We're in the last chapter, and he's in this section about love, but it seems like this hodgepodge, but Jesus has a theme here. Let's try to decode it, and in order to do it, let's jump down to the golden rule and start at verse 12. So bear with me. Here we are. Notice this. So... Because there's stuff before we're going to go back to later. So in everything. Now this is, this is huge. You don't have to have the 613 rules down. In everything, in every situation, it doesn't matter what you come across. This is the key. This is the rule for the situation. So in everything, do to others what you would have them do to you. That's, that's the second command in just other words. How, how do you know that, Mike? Because notice what he says next. For this sums up the law and the prophets. Isn't that the same thing that was said about love your neighbor as yourself? He's saying this is the master key. It's just another way of putting it. This is a description of love. Is it not? He said love your neighbor as yourself. And then later he says do to others what you would want them to do to you. And it's the same thing. This is the key for all locks. So this is how to deal with a Walmart cashier. This is, this is how to do, deal with that pesky neighbor. This is, this is the rule for how to handle your family, how to handle your teacher. This is the one. This is the golden rule. This is the ultimate. This is the decoder for everything you face in life. This is it. So in everything, this is what you're supposed to do. Do to others as you would want them to do to you. Now, what's so amazing about this is Jesus is the first one ever to say this. You realize there's a lot of cultures and a lot of time before Jesus came along. And they all dealt with morality and ethics and they had philosophy and they had rules too. Nobody ever in history had said this before Jesus. Ever. So Jesus is being truly, truly profound and original here. You see, every culture had the negative of this rule. The negative of this rule went like this. Do not do to anybody else what you wouldn't want done to you. That was the rule. Everybody had that rule. And basically, that's just a rule of self-preservation. Right? It's a simple rule of you don't pull on Superman's cape, you don't pull the mask off the old low ranger, and you don't mess around with Jim. Right? It's that rule. Don't, Don't do anything that will get your teeth knocked out. Don't do anything that's going to put you in the hospital. Don't do anything that's going to have a cost to it that you're going to have to pay the price for it and you're going to have a cast on for four weeks because you were stupid. You did to somebody else what you wouldn't want done to yourself. Every culture had that rule. And Jesus comes along and says, "Uh uh-oh, it's not that. Not for my people. You... 
all these other cultures don't pay the price, don't pay the price, don't pay the price, don't be stupid, don't pay the cost. Jesus comes along and says, I want you to pay the cost. And so he turns it on its head. He says, hey, do to others what you would want done to you. And that's what love looks like. That's what love looks like. Do to others what's in their best interest is another way of putting it. And even bearing the cost of it. Because now this is the positive rule. So, this is how it works. If you would like somebody to buy you lunch, what should you do? You should buy lunch. That's what this rule means. Do to others what you would want done to you. So if you'd like somebody to buy you lunch, why aren't you buying people lunch? If, if you would like people to take their time and, and, and look you in the eye and explain things without a brush off, then that's what you should do for others. You should bear the price tag of that. Because there's a cost to that, right? There's a cost to buying somebody lunch. There's a cost now to taking time with somebody and saying, hey, I'm going to give you five more minutes of my time in my busy, my busy day because you probably want me to explain this better because it's confusing. And I'm just going to take the time with you. I'm going to show you love, right? I'm going to do to you as I would want done to me. And I'm even willing to bear the price tag of it and give you my time to do it. That's love. That's, that's, the, that's the solution for every problem. So, if you're on the side of the road and you have a flat tire, and you're clueless about what to do with it, and a lot of people are, would you like somebody to stop and help you? If the answer is yes, then you should stop. You see how it works? But there's a price tag to that. Because now I have to, in my day, pull over on the side of the road, take my time to help you, and even get dirty, get grease all over me, and I have that appointment, but I would want somebody to do it for me, so I'm going to do it for you. That's the rule Jesus gave us. It's a very positive rule, and he's basically saying this, be willing to bear the price of giving people what's best for them. What... And how do you know what's best for them? Because you would like it yourself. Because you are the filter. And if you like it, assume they're going to like it and go do for them what you would have be done for you. So seek other people's best interests. That's the rule. Now that's an incredible rule, is it not? In fact, when we hear that rule, there's part of us, the sinful part that kind of bucks against that. It's just true. In fact, I don't believe this is a rule any other culture could have had before Jesus came along, and that's why they didn't have it. Because all the other rules were self-preservation rules. Don't pay the price. Don't get punched in the nose. You know, don't get sent to the hospital. Don't get in this awkward situation. And Jesus is saying, pay the price. Show grace, which is paying the price. Show grace, show mercy. And put yourself in other people's shoes and pay the price for them to get what they need, what's good for them. That's love. That's love. And so that's the golden rule. And so this is the rule that you should see at every cashier, right? In Walmart, they should have a little sign there. Not, not just for the cashier, for us, right? Every customer, we need this rule. This is, this is how we're supposed to treat each other. But the only way we can do it is if we embrace self-sacrifice. And that's why I don't think other cultures can do this. I think only we can do this, of all people. Because only in Christ can we love people this way. That we can be self-sacrificing in this way. That we can be gracious in this way because he's been gracious to us. The only reason we will pay the cost for others is because he paid the cost for us. But that's the rule, and it's absolutely challenging. And in that context, now we can understand this whole passage. So let's jump back up to verse 7. And so basically what Jesus is saying in this passage is, I'm going to ask you to live like I live. Basically, this do unto others as you would have them do unto you is actually how I, as God, live. I'm always seeking people's best interests, and I'm always willing to pay the price for it. And so I want you to do the same thing. So notice this. He's going to make a promise in verse 7. He says, Ask, and it will be given to you. 
Seek and you will find. Knock and the door will be open to you. For everyone who asks receives. The one who seeks finds. And to the one who knocks, the door will be opened. So, God's basically saying this. I'm going to make a promise to you. Because I love you. Because I am a God of love. And I'm seeking your best interest. And I'm willing to even pay the price for it. So, if you ask... And we got to be careful because actually in the Greek, that's a present imperative. What does that mean, Mike? Meaning it's not just one ask. It's a continuous ask. It's an over and over ask. It's actually almost like nagging. In fact, God encourages us to keep on asking in prayer. That's just, it's called importunity if you want the big fancy word. But God tells us to ask and keep on asking. And that's what that word ask actually means. It's ask and keep on asking. And then he says, seek and keep on seeking and knock and keep on knocking. And if you'll do that, I promise you, those who ask will receive, those who seek will find, and those who knock, I guarantee you the door will be opened. Well, that's a huge promise. But if you think about it, it makes me ask the question, why? Why, if God loves me, and he says he loves me, and he loves me in incredible ways, right? Why does he make me ask? Why does he make me seek? Why does he make me knock? If God knows everything, and he does, he knows I need this thing, I want this thing, why doesn't he just give me that thing without all the asking? And without all the seeking, and without all the knocking, what, what, does that sound like love? Because, hey, do unto others that, I w- that you would want to have done unto you. Seek other people's best interests and even embrace the cost of it. Believe it or not, this has everything to do with love. It has everything to do with love, but it takes insight to see it. The reason God wants us to ask, in fact, the Bible tells us this over and over, you do not have because you do not ask, right? James says it in those words, right? You do, you, there's actually things that God would give you that would God bring to your life if you'd actually take the time and ask for them. And you don't have them unless you do ask. Why is that love? Why is that in our best interests? It's in our best interest because we need God. And we have this natural tendency to want to live without God. And if God gave us everything we needed with ever having to go to him, we'd leave him totally out of the equation. And it involves us now involving him in the process. It forces us into the relationship. It makes us have to spend time with him. Is that a good thing or a bad thing? (laughs) <laughs> I've learned the hard way. That is a good thing. I can tell you, the days I do devotions, the day I spend close to the God, the days that I press into God and really live in that relation to him, those are my best days. They are. Because those are the days he, his character, his personality, his spirit flows into me. And what are the fruit of the spirit? Love, joy, peace, peace patience, kindness, goodness, gentleness, faithfulness, self-control, right? Those are the nine fruits of the Spirit. Where do they come from? Not from us. <laughs> they don't come from our fallen nature. They come from Him living through us. They're a fruit of the Spirit. And so if I'm ever going to be the person that I really can be, if I'm ever going to impact the world the way I'm going to impact the world, what do I have to do? i got to connect with God. So what's in my best interest? To spend time with God. So what does God do? He sets up a, a process where that if we really want to have what God wants us to have, he makes us do it with him. He makes us do it in relationship. And so it's good for us. And he does it because of love, because it's actually in our best interests. Parents, we do this with our kids all the time because that's what love looks like. Our kids resent it, but we make them do it anyway. Why? Because we're mean? No, because we love them. Do you make your kids do their homework? Why? Why do you make your kids do the homework? Because you're mean? Do you make your kids go to bed on time, get up in the morning, get ready for school? Do you make your kids say please and thank you and be polite? Do you make your kids do chores? Do you make your kids do any of these things? Why do you do them? 
Why do you do that to your child? Because they resent it. They hate it. They grumble, do they not? They, they talk about you behind your back. They do. My mom's she's so mean. She's such a dictator, right? I, I, I live in a totalitarian state. It's horrible. That's what kids think. And all you're doing is loving them. Why? Because you're giving them what they need, what's in their best interest, and you're willing to what? Bear the cost of it. Because that's what love does. It gives people what's in their best interest and is willing to bear the price for it. And so, God does the same thing. He's the best parent ever. He is the ideal father, right, in heaven. And so he says, hey, I love you so much and I want to provide in your life, but this is the process we're going to do. Ask and keep on asking, but more than that, now seek and keep on seeking. Why? Why does God say, hey, the way it's going to work is not only do I want you to persistently ask, but I want you to now go persistently seek for that thing. God actually wants us to put feet to our prayers. He wants us to act like the prayer's outcome is dependent on us. Did you hear that? He actually wants us to pray like everything depends on him, but act like everything depends on us. It's that tension. Why? It's the same thing with you and your kids' homework. You might help them with math, but you want them to do the math. Right? And so you'll be there and you'll push them. Why? Because it's the seeking, it's the process in which they grow. They learn math. But they learn more than math. What do they learn? They learn to work at things. They learn a work ethic. They, they, they learn this process of self-discipline. They, they learn what it's like to do things on their own and become more and more independent. And that's the catch. That's the tension that God wants us all to live in. He wants us to live dependent and independent lives. I know it sounds freaky, but that's what he wants. He wants us to live relationally dependent on him, do it in his power, but he wants us to do it. He wants us to seek it. He wants us. So, so, so let me just give you an example. It's, it's an obvious example that we all can relate to. Everybody at one time or another is going to need a job. And so what do you do? You ask God for that job. Do you not? You say, God, I really need a job. And I, I need a great job. I, I need a job that's right for me. Help me get this job. And you start with prayer. Hopefully we all do. But does it end there? And you just sit back and you, you, you get your Pepsi and you get your video games out and now, now it's, I'm just waiting for the job to come. No. You go and you start writing that resume, right? And, and you actually have friends look it over, find all the typos in it and you work on it. You make it the best resume you can. Why? Because it, it matters in the job process. So you're seeking and you keep on seeking. And so it's like, okay, not only am I going to write a resume, but I'm actually going to do something with it. Right? I'm actually going to get on Indeed or whatever, and I'm going to post it and apply for this job and apply for this job, and I'm going to put the word out to all my friends I'm looking for a job because a networking matters. And not only that, when the phone rings, I'm actually going to answer it because I put my phone number on my resume. And it could be somebody, right, wanting to talk about a job. And when they call, I'm actually going to be polite on the phone. I'm going to be I'm going I'm to pull out all those things my mom taught me to do that I kind of hate doing, but I'm going to do them because, hey, that's what it takes to get a job. And then what? You might get an interview. And do you go? Well, yeah, you go. And you dress for success. And you go and you prepare. And you put your best foot forward. Why? Because it's not just asking. You ask and keep on asking. But he says seek and keep on seeking. So we're always supposed to put feet to our prayers. Why? Because we grow in the process. Some of you parents are already getting this. It's really not about the job, is it? Is God's real goal for you to get, get you a job? He wants you to have a job. Don't, don't hear me wrong. But is that what God's really up to? Let me ask you a question this way. Having your kids do chores at home, is it really about the chores? Is it really about getting the dishwasher empty? And if you're a parent that says that, you don't understand what I'm talking about yet. It's not really about the dishwasher. It's really not about the homework. It's about your child. It's about you. God loves you. And he sees this incredible potential in you. And he wants you to become this person that can go do. 
that can go change the world, that, that becomes more and more courageous and confident, who can go and talk to people and shake their hands and look people in the eye and have conversations. He wants to develop us into the people we can be, and the process is finding the job. The process is emptying the dishwasher. The process is doing the homework and going to school. The process is all this other stuff, but God's using it to develop us because that's what love does. Love seeks what's best for others and does what? And is even willing to bear the cost. And that's what parents do. They bear the cost. That's what just love looks like. So one of the worst things we can do as parents is not push our kids to do things. Because the Bible tells us discipline actually is a mark of love. And if you're one of these parents that's backing off of all of that, trying to avoid awkwardness, avoid tension, is that love? Or is that about you now? And God says, I'm willing to embrace that. So, so, so what's the knock then? What, what is the knock? So he says, I want you to ask. Asking Now go and seek. Put feet to your prayers. What's knock? Knock is the next horizon. So picture it as a child. Or picture it at a home. You've lost your keys. You, you, you have this fear. You have this place that's comfortable. And, and you ask, right? God, show me where my keys are. But then you hunt all over the house and you chase it down. You go out to the car. You go to everywhere that's comfortable. Knocking is the next horizon. It's the thing that's not comfortable. It's, it's not your backyard. It, it's not your normal sphere. It's getting out of your normal sphere now and going to this uncomfortable sphere and knocking on somebody else's door and say, hey, have you seen my keys? That's what he's getting at. Why does he make me do that? That's, that's horrible. Man, I'll do the asking and the seeking, but there's no way I'm ever going to knock. Because God's trying to develop you to give you self-confidence and social skills. He's trying to get you to have this demeanor and be able, because you're an ambassador for Christ. Right? You're supposed to be salt and light. And how can you be salt and light if you never interact with anybody else out there? And so he's pushing us. He's nudging us. He's stretching us. And he says, yes, I even want you to go knock. But I promise you that if you'll ask and keep on asking and seek and keep on seeking and knock and keep on knocking, I'll, I'll open the doors for you. And I'll help you define what you're looking for. And I will give you what you need. Because that's what love does and that's now in that context that explains what he says next because notice what he says next because it doesn't seem to fit till you understand he says which of you if your son asks for bread will give him a stone he's now talking to us parents again he says which of you if your son is hungry and he's asking for bread is going to say I, here's a rock instead here's here's charcoal right? Or here's, a, here, here's just granite, right? Hey, or chomp on this. What parent would possibly do that? Then he says in verse 10, or if he asks for a fish because he's hungry, you're going to give him a poisonous snake, a snake. No, none of us parents would do this. And then he says something really hard that's hard to hear, verse 11, but notice what he's saying. He says, if you then, and though you are evil, do you hear that? Feel the weight of that for a second. Because he put it in there intentionally. If you then, though you are evil, and we kind of squirm a little bit under that one, but he's right. We all sin and fall short of the glory of God. We all struggle with selfishness and pride. We all struggle with lust and greed. We all struggle, right, with dishonesty. We all struggle with these things because of the fall. And God's working on us, and he's developed, but we, we're not holy and pure yet. We're not like him. And he's saying, so you that are imperfect, that are still imperfect, you still haven't reached the standard, and if you who aren't there yet know how to give good gifts to your children, and let's, let's just take a moment, because this is, this, is, this is massively huge for us. Notice this word. That's the crux. If you then, though you're evil, know how to give good gifts, and that's the key, they have to be good. How much more will your Father in heaven give good, he says it twice, 
give good gifts to those who ask him. Good. This answers all of the problems we have with God relative to prayer. Because is God going to ever give you a gift that's not good? Is he? Is God ever, when you ask for a fish, going to give you a poisonous snake instead? Is God ever, when you ask for bread, he's going to give you a stone instead? He's saying no. He says, if you know well enough, when your son asks for a stone, gives, <laughs> asks for bread, you give him real bread, right? And if he asks for a fish, you're going to give him a fish, right? And if you know to do that, don't he? Doesn't he who is in heaven, the perfect father, the, the author of love, the, the one who truly loves, won't he give good gifts to his children when they ask? So will God ever give you a gift that's not good? No. It's not in his nature. He can't do it. Why? Because he loves you. It's the definition of love. Love seeks the best interests of others and is even willing to bear the cost. So he's going to pay the price tag for the bread. He's going to pay the price tag for the fish. But he's going to make sure you have bread and a fish. He's not going to give you the stone or the snake. You see that? We got to, we got to believe this first of all. Is God ever going to give you a gift that's not good? Every good and perfect gift is from heaven above. That's, he's the author of the good. And that's all he knows how to do. And he won't do anything else. This is why God doesn't answer our prayers at times. This is hard. We get frustrated with God. We say, well, I asked, and I saw it, and I knocked. I did all that uncomfortable stuff, but he didn't answer my prayer. He didn't answer. He didn't do what I basically told him to do, what I asked him to do. He, he must hate me. He must, he must not like me. I wanted this job, and I got this job instead. What does that mean? Well, if you know God... It means he loves you. And it means you don't have the whole picture and he does. Because God is never going to give you anything that's not good. Now we will chase things that aren't good. And we can dismiss what he wants for us and chase what we want regardless what he says and ruin our own lives. But he's not going to do it. He's not going to do it. So if you pray, I want to marry that guy or I want to marry that girl and I want this job over here and I want to live in this place and God didn't do it, be thankful. Because this is what faith says. Faith says, I thought I wanted this job. I thought I wanted this guy. I thought I wanted to live in this place. But God knew better. <laughs> and he gave me something better. Because God only gives good gifts. How, how does that work? Well, God knows all this is what's crazy. We talk about the Marvel fans here, multiverse, all of that kind of stuff, science geeks. Okay. So God knows all of those permutations of everything. He knows the permutations and the outcomes of every possible decision or thing that can happen in our life. Can you imagine that? The, just the thinking skills, the, the computational skills of God, that he knows the ramifications of everything that could happen in your life. He knows what happens if you get this job. He knows what happens if you buy this car. He knows what happens if you marry this woman. He knows all of that stuff, right? He's got it all. He knows all the possibilities of everything, and that's how he determines good. So he says... Hmm, I see what happens. I know she's begging for this job right now, but I see what happens to her if she gets this job. And it ain't good. She thinks it'll be good, but I see the person she becomes and what this job does to her, so there's no way I'm giving her that job. There's no way. It's not good. And I only give good to my children because I love them. I seek what's best for them and I'm willing to bear the cost. And so she'll grumble, she'll complain, she might even walk away from me for six months and just be so angry and frustrated with me that she won't even speak to me for a while. But I'm okay with it. I'm okay. I want her to speak. Don't get me wrong. But I'm willing to take the pain. I'm willing to take the cost I'm willing to bear the brunt of her anger to give her what's good for her rather than what's bad for her. That's what love does. Now, this is hard. So let's go back because we got to talk about Marvel for a second. That's why the multiverse can't exist, right? Everybody who's thinking, you've, you've thought of this already, right? 
The whole multiverse is impossible. It's a, the whole concept, if you believe in a loving God, there's no way the multiverse can exist because there's no scenario where God won't give you what's good. So he won't give you less than good in this universe and less than this good in this universe, but this universe, oh yes, this is the good one. This is the one I'm giving her all good because God can't do that. That's contrary to his personality. So just throw that out. Stop thinking multiverse. It doesn't work. God will not do that. It is against his very nature. He can't. So, what we have to do is keep this mindset that God loves me and that I'm asking and I have this limited mindset and I can't see everything and I may ask for this and I may plead for this and I may even go chase this and I may seek it and seek it and seek it. Now notice the terminology in those phrases. He doesn't say that everybody who asks for it will get what they ask for. Notice he's very careful about his language. He doesn't say and everybody who seeks is going to get what they sought. He says, whoever seeks will find. He doesn't say we'll find what they're looking for. What they sought, they'll find what God's going to give them. And everybody who knocks, it doesn't say that the person on the other side of the door will give them what they're knocking for. What does it say? It says he'll open up the door. Doesn't it? Because God's very careful because he will never give you something bad. So what happens is we get all twisted in our thought and the enemy comes along and says, you must not really be loved by God. You must be a redheaded stepchild in the kingdom of God. You must be some second class citizen. He doesn't really love you because he didn't answer your prayer like he answers other people's prayer. Oh yes, he does. It works the same for all of us. And I can't tell you how many times God has told me no. But it's in my best interest, and I thank God he told me no. You think it would be good to win the lottery? Have you ever prayed for it? Publishers clearing house for the Christians in the room, because you're not allowed to play the lottery, right? Right? Would that be good? If it was good, why hasn't God done it? Because he knows what it would do to your life. He knows how it would ruin your life. He knows how it would kill the work ethic and drive you have and, and everything else that you need to become the person you could be. And a good father says, oh, that would be terrible. There's no way I'm ever letting you win the lottery. There's no way I'm letting you ever win Publishers Clear Nest. Why? Because I love you and it's about you. And I see you what you can be. I see the outcome of all of these best possible things that I'm going to do in your life. And I love you so much, I want to give you that. So don't fight me. And then go do exactly what I do, right? That's why the golden rule comes up in verse 12. So in everything, do to others what you would have them do to you. For this sums up the law and the prophets. Because this is what I'm going to do for you, so you go do it. Do what's best for others and be willing to embrace the cost. That's what he's saying. Love seeks the best for others and even embraces the cost. Now think about it. Isn't this what God has done in our life? Over and over, not, not just in prayer. Think, think, think of this through. Where, where was Jesus before he came in the flesh? He was in heaven, right? What do we call heaven? One of the key words is paradise, Right? In fact, Jesus says today to the man on the cross next to him, today you will be with me. Where? In paradise is what he said. So where was he? He was in this perfect place. Did he have to deal with the nonsense, political nonsense? Did he have to deal with the strife and the conflict? Did he have to deal with dysfunctional relationships? Did he have to deal with crime and abuse and bullying? Did he have to deal with any of that stuff where he was? No. He was in the perfect place, right? Without any of that stuff. But love seeks the best interests of others and is even willing to bear the cost. And so he came. He put himself in flesh. Imagine what God became flesh for us and entered the mess with us. He he entered the brutality and the meanness and the pettiness and the dishonesty. And he had people slandering him and beating him, right? Opposing him at every turn. And he's God. And he did it for you. He did it for me. He did it because that's what love does. 
It seeks the best for others and is even willing to bear the cost of it. And he bore the cost over and over and over. Imagine what it was like living with those disciples, those imperfect guys that just always were getting it wrong. And and he's always saying, guys, come on, get it. And he lives with them for three years in ministry. But before that, he's 30 years, right? Total on the planet before that. Dealing with all of it. And then when the time came and the notice came up that it is time, he faced the cross for us. Because that's just what love does. That's what a good parent does. They're willing to die for their children. To bear the whole price of it. And he died in our place. So we could live, so we could have this new life, or we could have this new rule that only we can live by because nobody else can have a heart like this because nobody gets God's heart placed in them like we do. We have to be rewired for this one. Do unto others as you would want done unto you. He has done incredible stuff for us, and it's out of that that now we can treat that Walmart cashier the way we need to. That we can deal with that obnoxious neighbor or that just rude coworker or just whoever we come across. And we can take the time and pay the price and say, hey, I'm going to give them what they need. I'm going to give them what's, bet, what's in their best interest right now. And sometimes it takes wisdom, right? But what would I want to be done right now? And that's what I'm going to do regardless of the price tag. Because that's the way God has treated me. Let's pray. Lord, I do praise you this morning for being great and glorious. For loving us in this incredible way that's that so hard to imagine. It's so, so not human. It's so not like us. It's so hard to wrap our brains around it even. It's just so radical. And so, so wow, self-sacrificing. Lord, help us to get this. Help us to realize that this is the key. This is the solution for the problem we haven't even faced yet. That all the other rules are commentary that express this. That that this is how I'm supposed to deal with everything that comes my way this day. Help us to get it. Help us to hold on to this rule and so meditate on it that it just becomes hardwired in us. And we get prepped and we, we just start filtering all these possible scenarios and thinking, hey, what would love say in this situation? What's the sacrifice I should make in this situation? What would I want done, truly want done, if it was in my best interest right now? Lord, help us to think differently. Help us to think like you. Help us to think like a good, good father. Thank you for your love. Mm. Thank you for doing constantly what's in our best interest, even if sometimes that's a no. Sometimes love just comes in tough packages and we thank you even for the tough times where you knew that was best for us and we just needed it. Help us to have the eyes of faith to see that and see it for what it really is, which is love. And Lord, help us to live in that love, live in that way. Just make us creatures, beings of love. We need it. And Lord, for those who are in the room or searching and on this path looking for answers, Lord, help them to see that you are it. You are the answer, that you are love, that you love them, and that cross was all about love, and that you died in their place so that their sins could be forgiven and they could have a relationship with you and embark on a way of life and help them to do that right now, just to say, man, I am a sinner. I I am selfish. I am proud. I do struggle with lust and greed and selfishness and dishonesty. I struggle with all that stuff. And Lord, help them to turn to you and receive you and be forgiven and find life, find love and this new way of love. And I ask this in Jesus' name. Amen.